Hi, Wesley. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Well, thank you. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Wesley Wildman. You are at the Boston uh, University School of Theology, where you're a professor. You're also co-founder of the Institute for Biocultural Study of Religion and the co-editor of the journal Religion, Brain, and Behavior and author of the book Religious and Spiritual Experiences. And I want to get into religious experiences before we're over, but I, I wanted to, before we're done, but I, I wanted to uh, start uh, with uh, a journal article of yours that uh, was published very recently called Theology Without Walls, The Future of Trans-Religious Theology, mm. uh, which is a very uh, interesting subject so far as I'm concerned. Uh Partly because, you know, at the end of the, the article, you talk about the prospect that trans-religious theology could naturally culminate in a post-religious theology or non-religious theology. That would strike some people as a contradiction in terms, of course. So maybe uh, I, I, we'll start out there and I'll ask you, what would that be like, a post-religious or non-religious theology, and why would you call it a theology? Mm. Most people who use the word theology immediately think of a specific religious community mm -hmm. and people trying to understand their practices and their active faith and their beliefs and so forth, and they call that process of understanding theology. But there are other ways to think about theology. Theology can be understood as a form of philosophical inquiry whose institutional home isn't any religious group, but instead is basically the academic world, the university. Um, and of course, with no religious home, there are pros and cons. Uh, the, the pros are that you're not enthralled to any particular religious framework or any particular religious authorities. And the cons are that you lose some of the efficiency associated with inquiry and theology when it is run through particular traditions. It's more specific, for example. Um, another con is it's difficult to get the relevant information to guide theological reflection when you're doing it in a trans-religious way. Um, you have to be able to work across cultures, for example, and that's very demanding. Another, another, another pro, then, is that you get to use the scientific study of religion. It becomes your friend rather than a problem. Now, if you're in trans-religious theology and if you've been doing it for a while, it becomes very obvious that you really don't need religious traditions to be able to function in a trans-religious way. What you do need is a history of thought, which you can get in lots of different ways, including from theological traditions. But they don't need to be live theological traditions for them to be relevant. Um, and moreover, the, when, when your community of discussion is in the university, it's um, easy to see how it could just keep going without needing to be planted in a religious institution. Okay. Well, let, me, let, me, uh, let me ask you a question about that. I, I mean, you, you, uh, it, it's clear that uh, you're... I mean, a lot of this paper is kind of about, uh, it, well, it's not about what the substance of a trans-religious theology might be so much, although I definitely want to get into that and, 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 and what, for that matter, the substance of a, of a post-religious theology would be. But a lot of the paper is about the structure of the discourse and kind of the home for the discourse. I mean, you would like trans-religious theology to be something that takes place within what you call the secular academy. So it wouldn't, I mean, you're at Boston University, and I think you are involved in what might be thought of as the secular part of Boston University, right? And in terms of, uh, you know, the graduate program there in, I don't know, religious studies or, wh or whatever it is. But, um, but in general, people in religious studies departments don't consider themselves engaged in theology. Now, that m was probably different in a lot of places 100 and 150 years ago. There was probably a much uh, blurrier line, but I think now uh, religious studies departments are quite, uh, uh, tend to be pretty emphatic about the fact that they are studying religion from a non-religious point of view. E even if they themselves might be religious, they're studying it from a non religious point of view. So I can imagine a certain amount of resistance uh, <laughs> emanating from there. If you propose 
that they uh, adopt this uh, this trans religious theology thing uh, because it is, uh, you know, it has the word theology in it. And, and maybe we should actually stop there. Just flesh that out a little more. What what is trans religious theology? It, it, it I gather that on the one hand, it doesn't take on faith any of the assumptions built into specific religious traditions, right? Because it is supposed to accommodate the diversity of religious belief in some sense, right? But on the other hand, theology, it is it is in some sense growing out of a religious tradition. In fact, I mean, I guess we should ask you, do you identify as w with a religious tradition yourself? All right, so you've just asked me three really important uh, it, Right, I realize that. I apologize for the long wind. Okay, but but I'll I'll ask them. Um, I'll answer them very briefly in order. First, um, you're right about religious studies. Um, in the middle of the 20th century, when most of the religious studies departments in the United States uh, was formed, there was a lot of blurring between theological studies and religious studies, and that has largely been clarified, which I think is a very good thing uh, in the course of uh, the last 20, 30 years. So yes, now religious studies departments don't see themselves as doing theology, though they may still still see themselves as doing religious thought, uh, understood as a kind of philosophy of religion, which would be, in my mind, uh, open, amenable to trans-religious theology. That would be the proper venue for it there. But there's no reason for trans-religious theology to be in religious studies. It can equally well be in philosophy departments. It really doesn't make any difference. Um, as for uh, what it is, uh, you've got it right. There's a kind of there's a kind of obligation, I think, a debt that transreligious theology owes to theological tradition, since it's that's the way religious thought has passed to the present. And if transreligious theologians want to work across religious traditions, of course they're welcome to, but they can't do so arrogantly. They need to remember where they came from. I think it's important to do that. As to my own identity, um, I have a complex religious identity. But, um, fundamentally, I'm known as a religious naturalist. That is to say, um, I both reject any supernatural beings or supernatural agency, but at the same time affirm that there's a kind of religious depth to the world. Richard Dawkins calls that Einsteinian religion, and that's what I would uh, identify with personally as a body of beliefs. I have a professional affiliation uh, with Christianity. Um, I'm actually an ordained pastor in the, or minister in the Uniting Church of Australia, um, where my um, uh, and in my I see what I'm doing in the seminary at Boston University as an expression of that ministerial calling. But of course, I do it as a religious naturalist and as a trans-religious theologian. I'm also profoundly influenced by several other religious traditions. Most of my spiritual practices and self-understanding come from Buddhism and from Confucianism. So there's a certain understanding of lack of attachment that I prize in my daily life. And there's an understanding of cultivating virtues that comes from uh, from uh, Confucianism that I also prize. Mm -hmm. I'm generally influenced by a lot of other traditions, but in terms of my spiritual outlook, it's especially Buddhism and Confucianism. Do you, do you meditate regularly? Um, I do walking meditation, which mm -hmm. is one of the kinds of meditation that people talk about. I don't really enjoy sitting. I don't get um, <laughs> much out of that. Okay. Well, so there's a lot there. I mean, I... I uh, and maybe one question will that uh, the answer to which may emerge in the course of this is to what extent your own path uh, is parallel to the path you envision for uh, for uh, transreligious theology. But uh, and one way to get into that is, I assume when you were ordained, you were more conventionally Christian than you are now, or not? No, I've been about this way since my late teens. So I, I just didn't know. Um, at the time of my late teens that there were these traditions out there so I was struggling within a tradition that didn't quite fit and my my ordination I think was slightly controversial uh, in the church but there are there are a lot of people who um, I wasn't as articulate about my beliefs as I am now back then and there are a lot of people who um, who understood it to be a good and an important thing despite the fact that it was a little unconventional so I think it was on that basis that finally they approved me with a split vote. Okay, so now you 
adhere to Einsteinian religion, and a lot of people would say that that's no religion at all, right? I mean, one view of Einstein is that he, he was just using God as a kind of metaphor. I mean, when he said that uh, God does not play dice, uh, meaning that he didn't think there was true randomness in the universe, uh, that that's just a statement of saying that his conception of the way the natural laws uh, are, or maybe are were set up, although that, of course, <laughs> opens up another question if you use the phrase were set up. But anyway, that, 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 that maybe he just meant the way he thinks of the natural laws is his very regular and deterministic things and, and, and so on. And that, yes, he did profess wonder, intellectual wonder, but there are certainly a lot of people, including Richard Dawkins, I think, who would say <laughs> wonder, intellectual wonder is a wonderful thing, but it ain't religion. So, uh, is, does your, uh, I mean, I guess that your reference to Buddhism and Confucianism suggests that maybe there's a little more to your spirituality than to Einstein's, or at least it has some uh, dimensions his didn't. But what, what do you say to, to that? That, that? Look, if it's really Einsteinian religion, you do not belong, you know, uh, in, uh, at a school of theology, as that term is traditionally understood, or you, or, or, or you shouldn't use the word religion? <clears throat> I see myself as in a fight to protect the existing religious traditions from a kind of anthropomorphic extremism. That anthropomorphic extremism arises when people think of God as, a, as a, an agent, as a human being writ large. <clears throat> I... Um, don't like it. I think it's wrong. Uh, the Christian tradition has always fought over that issue. I'm on the side of the philosophers and the mystics who think that however we use the word God, it has to refer to something that's beyond human comprehension and it cannot possibly be expressed as an agent or as a being in any sense. So you to invoke Paul Tillich, uh, the theologian, uh, whatever God is, is beyond the categories of existence and non-existence. So um, I see myself as carrying forward one particular strand within the Western philosophical and theological traditions, including in Christianity. And as such, I represent that faithfully in the current day. I continue the same battle that those people have always fought against the presence of anthropomorphism and superstition in religion. Now, at the same time, religious naturalism uses the word religion, so it suggests that there's a community, there's a bunch of rituals, there's an ethical outlook and so forth. Um, currently, religious naturalism has found great difficulty in forming a community. There are several types of communities that have attempted to form themselves around something like that. but. Um, so I consider the use of the adjective religious in that phrase to be a bit of language stretching at the moment. Religion really might not be the best word for it. You could see it as a philosophical outlook uh, that involves ethical and spiritual practices. You could call it spiritual naturalism, I suppose. But um, I do concede that there's a serious problem using the word religion for something like this. Okay. Uh, so maybe a, a natural follow-up question is... Uh kind of twofold. I, I mean, okay, so religious naturalism. We know what the naturalism means. You have a basically scientific outlook and reject uh, posited supernatural forces and beings. <clears throat> As for the religious part, uh, I assume hanging on to that means that there's something about what religion has traditionally provided that is provided by religious naturalism. Mm. It would not be things like we know for sure that after death, you go to heaven if you've been good. I assume that would not be part of it. Right. But consolation about death is one thing religions have done. They've done other things. They've provided moral guidance and so on. So what parts of traditional religion, what functions of traditional religion, psychological or social, are mm. preserved in religious naturalism? Mm. If you've got a community of religious naturalists, as uh, I do, a loose-knit community, uh, there are all kinds of social aspects that you would see in ordinary religions that carry over into the religious naturalist environment. Uh, so um, uh, there's just common mutual support and so on, but you don't need religions for that type of support. You can get that in lots of different ways from your bowling club, or your bridge club, or your friends in the neighborhood and so forth. Uh, the moral outlook is essentially humanistic. Um, it's a kind of enlightened humanism, I think, that's wide, wide open to the whole natural world and the values inherent in the natural world. And that uh, is uh, in parallel with religion, which gives people moral outlooks. 
Uh, corresponding to that, there's uh, an obligation, if you have a moral outlook, there's a moral obligation to cultivate personal virtues and social practices and policies that are commensurate with the outlook. And moral um, virtue cultivation is a very important part of my understanding of religious naturalism and my personal practice as a person. Now, that means both social policies and actions and individual behavior. So they are very important to me. And, and what are some elements of the ethical system that you may think uh, are shared by many religious traditions? I mean, is, is it like selflessness? Is that one or yeah, what? Yeah, it is one. Uh, there's uh, there's <laughs> an evolutionarily extremely unstable concept that has emerged in most religious traditions having to do with unconditional love or radical love or <laughs> things like that. There does not appear to be um, uh, any evolutionary reason for that to appear. There is an evolutionary reason for limited love to appear that, in, that enhances cooperation, but the radical love, the extreme love, it's hard to see how that would arise. Nevertheless, it's an idea that's been set loose within humanity, and it's an idea that I endorse and most people do endorse. So I take people like Gautama and Jesus to be models for what it means to be boundary-breaking in love and acceptance and community building, for example. And what, what are some examples of applying that principle, radical love, in a, in a contemporary context in ways that are boundary breaking. I mean, there are people in the world I could name that most Americans don't love. <laughs> in fact, there are right. people I could name that most Americans wish they could kill. Uh, you know, uh, one of them we did kill a few years ago, Osama bin Laden. I, I mean, how, uh, and, and I could name types of people, you know, mass murderers and, and so on. What, uh, what what are some radical expressions of radical love? Mm. Uh, locally, uh, Gautama and Jesus both demonstrated an ability to welcome into friendship people that were often outcast. So I think that's where it begins. It begins right there at home. When it comes to social polity, pol politics, war and so forth, you've got a balancing act to do. You have to worry about control. You have to worry about power, which are real issues in the world. Uh, and you also have to worry about what your private moral compass is. So um, uh, I'm in conflict there, uh, like most people are, and I have to balance that conflict. So, for example, uh, I'm not a pacifist. I do agree that sometimes it's important to use force to resolve situations. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, I would try to understand the people that I'm partially responsible for killing as people that I can love. That is very difficult. Uh, it requires a kind of um, a disciplined moral practice, but uh, there is actually a tradition among warriors of being able to do that. There's also a tradition among hunters of doing the same thing when you're hunting things that are non-human. So uh, there are virtues that can be cultivated in that regard, and that's truly groundbreaking. Not, not groundbreaking, I'm sorry, boundary-breaking. It's boundary breaking. Yeah, not as boundary breaking as saying don't kill them in some cases. I mean, there are probably yeah, people who argue that you're actually abetting the killing if you if you just uh, it, by by uh, calming the moral qualms that the the soldiers may have. Yes, you are. I think uh, that's true. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is to exacerbate the conflict, not squash it. So the practice that I just described forces you repeatedly to confront the conflicted identity of someone who supports war and at the same time insists on loving everyone. Mm -hmm. And so must not let that tension disappear. Otherwise, all you're doing is throwing oil on the water and it's uh, disguising what's beneath. And I assume that uh, your reference to a embracing outcasts at a local level would include homeless people, uh, uh, former, uh, you know, convicts, prisoners, uh, and so on. Right, exactly. Uh, widows, orphans, just like Jesus said. It's um, the sense in which I'm a Christian is uh, can be stated precisely like this. Um, I follow Jesus, his moral outlook, his point of view, I follow him as best I can. He and I would disagree over many things, including the conception of ultimate reality that he holds, which is different than mine. But I still endeavor to follow him in what I do. And I also follow Gautama the Buddha in a similar sense. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's, the, that's the oldest and most traditional understanding of being a Christian. 
being a follower of Jesus, and that's the one I adhere to. Okay, so back to this uh, business of trans-religious theology in light of what you've said. Uh, so it consists of people who do identify fundamentally with one or maybe two or three religious traditions, but are in some sense using that as a starting point. Uh, but right. I take it the rules include, do the rules include you can't take anything on faith or and you can't claim some special revelation that no one else has access to? Because, Correct. because that would rule out such important uh, features of Christianity, important from the point of view of many Christians, as Jesus was resurrected, Jesus was the Son of God, and so on, right? Right. Those things are entered into transreligious theology as assertions by particular religious communities about the way the world is and things that happened in the past. Entered as assertions, but not taken for granted, not taken on faith, not understood in any sense as authoritatively delivered to the theological task. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those things uh, those things are wide open for discussion, and when you discuss them, you have to discuss them across traditions. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how ultimate reality is understood in every tradition that's available, that every tradition that you can absorb as a scholar and as a person. And is this idea of ultimate reality uh, something that, I, I, I doubt Einstein mentioned that, I doubt Richard Dawkins would would use the term. It, it, is taking that seriously something that makes you a little more than Einsteinianly religious in the minimalistic sense? Mm. I don't think so. Um, Einstein drew his religious framework from the philosopher Spinoza. And uh, Spinoza would have been comfortable with these categories, um, as would have Plato and Aristotle and lots of other people in the philosophical traditions. They're not conceiving of it personally as a personal deity, but they are conceiving it as something that needs to be talked about. You cannot let discussion lapse, because if you do, you've lost something crucial about the character of reality. At the same time, it's clearly hard to understand, and science helps us probably more than anything else to get a grip on what ultimate reality really is. Well, yeah, it seems to uh, it seems to be showing us that that whatever is at the bottom of things continues to be elusive. I mean, right? I, I, I by that I mean that uh, as you get into quantum physics, subatomic particles, it it seems more and more that you're entering a realm where it's just not going to make sense to the human mind in a certain sense. I mean, the math may work, but if you ask, if you try to describe them you know, what in, in kind of common sense language and conception does the math point to about the nature of reality? Same things seem to break down in a way that they didn't with Newtonian physics. Yeah, they do. So this is uh, folk physics, as, uh, as it's sometimes called. It really doesn't work uh, against the real world very well at all. But neither does folk religion. Uh, the, the interesting thing about transreligious theology is it forces you to look at all of nature, everything we know about it, and the public forms of discourse that tell us about that are really important, but uh, folk religion does not help you understand ultimate reality very well. You need to transcend folk religion in transreligious theology if you're going to have a shot at it at all. Otherwise, you're just talking about a bunch of parochial people's ideas about what's real, and that's interesting historically, but it doesn't have any evidential weight. You need to construct the evidential weight differently using philosophical methods. Okay. But, but I guess I'm also asking, well, how much help is science really giving us in conceiving of ultimate reality? Or is it just the nature of ultimate reality that, as you know, people have been known to say, you can't conceive it? Yeah, I don't think uh, science helps much except by ruling out things that don't work. For example, ruling out supernatural agency, it doesn't explicitly rule it out, but it makes it less plausible. So that's the sense in which I mean ruling out. So there's this uh, deep puzzle about science. It it spawns a whole bunch of questions that are not scientific questions, such as what is the good, what is ultimate reality, and so forth. You can't answer those questions inside the sciences, but the sciences constrain what you can say about those questions. Every second year, I teach a year-long course on science literacy and scientific boundary questions. And in that class, we cover what the science says. We try and trace out what the boundary questions are in ethics, in theology and philosophy and so forth and uh, see how the scientific knowledge that we have constrains our conceptions as we move into the philosophical or ethical realms. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you've mentioned philosophy a few times. 
uh, including when I when I seemed earlier in the conversation to be assuming that if uh, if uh, trans religious theology were imported into the secular academy, it would be imported into departments of religious studies. You suggested that in a way, uh, at least as natural home, maybe more natural home might be philosophy departments, which I, upon reflection, yeah, that you're right. Uh, the um, it does raise the question of why not just. In other words, why do the philosophy departments need the, this help? Why do they need to import anything? They've been trying to grapple with all kinds of fundamental questions from a secular point of view, as informed by science. Uh, why? Uh, what? What's the appeal to them of welcoming a bunch of people who call themselves trans-religious theologians? Well, they wouldn't call themselves that. In a philosophy department, they'd call themselves philosophers of religion, which is what I call myself, and they would function quite naturally there. Their topic would be to understand religious thought as it's developed, and also perhaps to do constructive philosophical metaphysics, where you try and build theories. And that, uh, philosophy builds theories in all kinds of ways. The reason why they've given up on building theories in religion uh, around religious ideas is because it's just a total mess conceptually and it's very difficult to get into and there are some very powerful philosophical arguments that it's an intellectually futile exercise. But I've tackled those arguments and cleared the way I think for uh, for the exercise of philosophical a philosophical theology or philosophy of religion or trans-religious theology, mm -hmm. cleared the way without showing that it can actually work. You can only show that it can work by making a case in a, over a long term by actually you know, making religious ideas count. But you can clear the way by refuting the arguments that attempt to show that it's impossible. So A.J. Ayer's arguments and logical positivism or Immanuel Kant's arguments and so forth. And I've tried to do that. Okay. Well, I would guess one of the common sense objections you would get to the enterprise would, would be, you know, again, that if, if to do trans-religious theology you have to abandon everything in your tradition that uh, doesn't pass various tests, right? It's, you, 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 can't, you can't hang on to stuff you take on faith. You can't hang on to th things that are products of special revelation. And in a certain sense, what you assert has to be, uh, there has to be a kind of compatibility with other religious perspectives, or at least there has to be a sensitivity or to the perspective of something. Anyway, I guess the objection would be, well, what's left? You, you can say, I accept Jesus as an ethical guide, but what, what beyond that? I, I mean, don't you pretty quickly get to the end of the road is maybe what I'm asking, where you just start calling it philosophy and with the assistance maybe, or with the you know, with the additional asset of being able to point to some traditionally religious figures whose thinking was uh, compatible with your philosophy and maybe even inspirational within the context of your philosophy? Mm. Well, the apophatic mystics in all of the traditions that I've studied have never run out of things to say, ironically, considering they're <laughs> supposed to turn away from language. Uh, which is an indication, I think, of the sort of depth structures and dynamics that we're talking about in the root of reality. That's ultimate reality to me, and to me it's almost endlessly fascinating. I don't think you get to the end of the road very quickly as a result. What I do think you do is very quickly reach the limit of everything that positive religions have to offer to theology. You reach that limit very quickly, but uh, I think the endless wonders that follow are absolutely captivating, and they captivate scientists every bit as much as they capture, uh, captivate philosophers like me. Okay. Um, when I was reading your article, a, a kind of famous metaphor occurred to me that I don't think you mentioned in the article, but it's Wittgenstein's ladder metaphor where, you know, he says, I guess he's talking about his own argument in the Tractatus or something, but he says, this is a ladder you use to get to a point where you look down and realize that the ladder itself is flawed and you throw it away, but, but it got you here. I mean, that, that's kind of the way you're looking at traditional religious thought, right? It gets you it gets you to kind of pure philosophy, but you don't want to like, you don't want to jump to pure philosophy. You think there's virtue in using the ladders and climbing there. Yeah, I do. I think there's a tremendous amount of sensitivity encoded in theological traditions. All of the ones I've studied, they, they, are, they record with better fidelity the actual content 
of experience of people that leads to serious constraints on theology. So if you just sit there and have some intellectual picture of the world and it never comes to grips with people's anxiety in the face of death or their horror at their own shortcomings and the guilt that they carry with them all the time and their inability to do what they really want to do, these very poignant aspects of the human condition, um, then, of course, what you've done is essentially become non-empirical in your theological work. The theological traditions are much better than the philosophical traditions at preserving all of that information. And that, that they do it beautifully, extremely powerfully, you know, captivating uh, even uh, to me. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for those theological traditions. And that's why I think we need always to remember where we come from as transreligious theologians and philosophers. So you're... You're advocating a um, a philosophy that is, this isn't the only kind of philosophy you're advocating, but you would like to see a kind of philosophy that is very attentive to the psychological needs of people. You could call them the spiritual needs of people, I guess, but in any event, the needs that are reflected in, in religions. Yes, correct. Yep, <clears throat> suffering is a big problem for human beings and so is evil and these things need to be built into the philosophy that we call religious naturalism or that we call trans-religious theology. Otherwise, it's just not living up to any part of its name, really. So at this point, you might get a different kind of objection from uh, philosophers. Not not that, that you're drawing on religion, but that you want to introduce the idea of a uh, practical use of, of, of you know the, you're saying we want news you can use from psycho from philosophy or they might say you're trying to turn us into a self-help discipline and we're not going to filter our inquiry with 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 that constraint in mind the constraint of whether people are going to find it inspiring or consoling i mean maybe it's a bleak meaningless universe and if it is we're going to say it yeah yeah <clears throat> and then they should and i do so uh, uh, I would really, with that particular objection, I would uh, fight against that very hard. I'm not interested in it being a self-help movement or a self-help discipline. Other people will do that. I'm interested in empirical adequacy. This is a form of empirical philosophy. <clears throat> if you're going to try to get people to understand the way the world is, not for their well-being, just to tell the truth, as a philosopher should, Part of that involves helping them understand the human condition. That's an essential part of it. To get that right, you need to pay attention to the relevant sources of data, and your theories need to be fully responsive to those data. Okay. Now, you say in the paper at one point that some philosophers are doing work that is, quote, virtually theological. What are examples of that? I don't know if you want to name people, but at least give us a sense of the kind of philosophical thought that is you know represents what you would hope is the kind of culmination of this uh trans-religious theology <clears throat> well i think it's easy to point to people in the past i think plato is virtually theological in my sense i think plotinus is and, and what part of plato he he's better known than Plot plotinus but what, what part of plato is is an example of this his articulation of the good. So in the Republic, when he talks about the divided line and he sets up uh, sort of levels of greater and lesser intensity of being at the top of the story is the form of the good. He does not understand that in any sense anthropomorphically, uh, which suits me very well. And yet at the same time, uh, it is theologically incredibly potent. And I think he understood himself to be saying something theologically potent, though without the word, because for him, theology meant <clears throat> discussion of the gods in the polytheistic okay. Greek context. Okay, so there's an ethical dimension, and the ethics is not, you know, purely relativistic or nihilistic. Is that, is that one way of saying it? Right. <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It's uh, okay. The, the ethics is a complicated uh, question. Um, all, all on its own, I'm not sure how much that ball of wax you want to open up here, but let me just say uh, briefly that I'm um, an ethical pluralist. So I take the ethical affordances that show up in nature to be exploitable or realizable in a lot of different ways. Those ways can sometimes conflict. So, so I combine ethical realism, which is a kind of critical realism. It's, it's, the, it's the idea that there is such thing as ethical truth in a sense, right? That, er, yes. that ethical that, ideas are in some sense kind of out there. Yes, and that truth shows up, uh, shows up to us in the form of possibilities. But to actualize possibilities, we need to make choices. 
as Nietzsche said, we need to take responsibility for those choices, and that's an awesome kind of responsibility that we often find disorienting. We are not getting messages from the beyond that tell us what to do. We're using stories about the beyond to calm the pain associated with taking full responsibility for your own moral actions. When we take moral actions, we're realizing certain possibilities and foreclosing others. Mm -hmm. Other people make other choices. So moral pluralism at the same time as moral, a kind of moral realism. Okay. It'd be like a virtual moral realism. Okay, so a kind of ethical dimension is one uh, part of philosophy that can, I guess, help make it, quote, virtually theological. What about at a metaphysical level? I mean, should I be thinking of like Kant, who, as I very dimly understand him, was suggesting that there was something beneath the surface appearance of things that, uh, you know, the thing in itself or the noumena or whatever, that uh, is deeper... And that we and that the human mind cannot comprehend is that is that a, a theological idea? Yeah, it is. How do you get good theological ideas as a trans-religious theologian? Do you go to Kant or whatnot? I, I think the the solution there is that you need to get good at comparison. You need to look at God ideas from across the philosophical and religious traditions, the wisdom traditions of our planet. And you need to form categories for comparing them and talking about them that distort the actual usage as little as possible. Ultimate reality was a category that was introduced by Max Weber and adopted by Paul Tillich. Um, it was an extremely important category at the time, and it's persisted because of its virtues along those lines. It mm -hmm. tends to register what's important. It's got a contact points with all religious traditions and philosophical traditions. But at the same time, it doesn't uh, distort them particularly. Mm -hmm. So it's a vague category. It's a general category. It can be specified in lots of ways. It's a category I appreciate and use to talk about what it is that's behind things, what it is that we're really trying to talk about as philosophical theologians. And in some contemplative traditions, there is, I think, the aspiration to come at least closer <laughs> to apprehending it, if, 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 even if by definition you can't completely get a grip on it, right? Right. Yes, the, the best of those uh, traditions of contemplative practice understand themselves, I think, to be helping you engage something which is infinitely rich. You can't ever completely uh, absorb it or control it or understand it. Uh, and of course, in the process of that, pro uh, of that engagement, you need to purify your engagement because it often involves delusions or wishful thinking or anthropomorphic tendencies or other forms of cognitive error. It's a, it's a long and arduous process, but it's a, it's a kind of discipline that anyone with spiritual interests is pretty much engaged in, pretty much anyone is engaged in, but under a lot of different descriptions. Religious naturalists are no different. They've got that journey going as well. I call it a spiritual journey. And I assume that the idea is that there is a kind of connection between these two things, the conception of ultimate reality and the ethical dimension. So, uh, you know, I, I think in con contemplative traditions, there is the idea that as you get closer to getting the picture, or at least understanding what was wrong about the picture you had, what was misleading about the picture you have in ordinary consciousness, but as you move toward toward at least a, a, a closer comprehension of ultimate reality, there is in that a kind of ethical guidance. Either mm -hmm. you, you realize that there were some kind of illusions you had that played out at an ethical level and led you to be a bad person or something, or the experience just makes it feel natural to be a better person or something. But, but the broad question is, should there be, are you looking for a system where there is a connection between your conception of what is at the heart of reality and your guiding ethics? Most religious naturalists would definitely say yes in answer to that question. They would say that the ethical system that you get that's consistent with a naturalistic way of thinking is an enlightened form of humanism that's open to the ecological world. Um, my own view on that uh, is just a little more complex. Um, it's implied in what I said earlier that I, I don't think at the root of things, the moral possibilities that we are presented determine a particular moral path. What they determine is a web of possibilities that are constrained. We choose in that web of possibilities to realize some and foreclose others. So we're making um, a kind of hypothetical realization of moral possibilities. That's the thing we need to take responsibility for. And it's underdetermined by my understanding of ultimate reality. 
Therefore, I need to turn to wisdom traditions for guidance. So when someone asks me, well, how do you know what the good is? And I'll say, well, uh, partly from my environment, my social context, but especially because I orient my moral behavior by wisdom traditions such as those of Jesus and Gautama. Uh, so that's how I make my mind up about what I want to do. We all have to make choices about what kind of being to be, morally speaking. And my choices are made in that way. Okay. Um, so you, uh, your book, Religious and Spiritual Experiences, which I take it is somewhat in the tradition of William James's varieties of religious experiences, uh, right. and that it's a work of, de of description, uh, uh, you know, kind of cross-cultural description. Um, how does that connect, if at all, with, with this, this uh, enterprise of trans-religious theology? Mm. Yes, we have this. Uh, we have these amazing bodies. Uh, we can do all kinds of tricks with them. If if you put us in a sensory deprivation tank, uh, the vast majority of human beings are going to start seeing things and hearing things. They just are. That's the way our body works. Um, so there, there's a thousand things that are really weird that we can do. Uh, really weird uh, meditation states, for example, are very very strange things, and uh, some of them are really potent and powerful. Now. Um, I don't take any of that as self-explanatory or as epistemologically clear. I don't think people know they don't have grounds to trust the thoughts that they have in those states. Um, therefore, there's a great challenge. How do you understand those extreme moments, those intense moments of human experience that are so important to us, that orient us often? You know, you have a near-death experience and forever after your whole life is built around that experience. But how do you know whether you can trust them? And how do you know the sense in which you can trust them and the sense in which you need to hold them at arm's length and criticize them? How do you know that it's smart to take your moral bearings from them and so on? They are the sorts of questions that are taken up in that book. Isn't the answer that you never know? I mean, you never, you can never, I mean, any kind of, strictly speaking, any kind of strange experience, you, you at least can't take for granted its truth. You would at a minimum have to subject it to some kind of analysis. Right. Correct. You can't take it for granted. But I think as a fallibilist and pragmatist, I don't think you ever know anything for sure. But I do think you can build confidence in certain beliefs that you think, or, or, or decrease confidence in certain beliefs. So what you're doing is playing with the plausibility structure surrounding the belief that you endorse based on an experience. The more you understand the experience, the more you impact the plausibility of the beliefs that you formed around it. So I've had friends who've had profound mystical experiences who immediately connect them with the religious tradition from which they belong. And it's uh, the convictions they have from those experiences are held with almost infinite strength. They're just unshakable. But I've also had friends who don't have religious upbringing who've had similar experiences. And for them, it's a great puzzle. They don't know what to do with it. They want to understand it. It's happened to them. It feels important, but they don't know how to make sense of it. And the uh, wisdom traditions of religion help to help people discern, I think, how to understand what to trust in those experiences and what not to. It turns out that it's not the skeptics about religious experience that have pushed uh, skepticism the strongest. It's the, it's the discernment traditions in religious traditions that have pushed it strongest. So the senior Buddhist overseer of young monks who are practicing, sitting, right, who are meditating, that's the person who pushes skepticism harder than anyone else does. Mm -hmm. And they, they do so with a tremendous amount of concrete experience in mind. And they know when experiences are delusory to some extent. At least they're able to recommend a way of thinking about it. Yeah, I would think that's better developed in some of the Eastern traditions than in uh, some of the Western, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I don't know if you're right about that. In the Western contemplative traditions, there are incredibly rich discernment practices as well, often handled in communities in the same way that it's done in a Buddhist monastery. Uh, but... Um, What's, what's different is that there is in the South Asian traditions particularly incredibly refined discussions of meditation states that we don't find anywhere in the West. Mm -hmm. We don't find it in the Eastern traditions either. We find it especially in the South Asian traditions, South Asian Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, that, that's distinctive. But the discernment practices are actually pretty common and the criteria that are used in trying to discern whether it's smart to believe something that you're inclined to believe based on a religious experience. 
those those discernment criteria are pretty similar across cultures. Okay, maybe we can uh, try to come up with an example of an experience where where ultimately discernment practices uh, would be useful. And maybe the way to start is, you know, you said you've had friends who had experiences that were not in the context of a specific religious tradition. Uh, are, can you describe uh, what, uh, one such experience or a kind of experience? Uh, and it might be an experience that had they had it within a religious tradition, you think they would have attached, you know, some of that uh, furniture to it, but 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 are there you know I mean what's an example of a kind of experience somebody might report to you? So um, uh, most people, when a loved one dies, a loved one to whom they're very close and they've been involved with, they um, the, the, about half of them experience the presence of that person afterwards. They don't normally talk about it. You need to do your surveying very carefully to get to that number because they are ashamed or shy or worried that people think they're crazy or something. But they hear them, or they see them, or they sense, or they sense their presence. Now, um, those ex that's a class of experiences I'm talking about. But I know a bunch of people who've had experiences like that. Now, those people um, in, in, are, are often inclined to believe in ghosts after an experience like that. That's the temptation. There's got to be some kind of discarnate entity there, or there's some type of spirit world that's capable of communicating to me in this period after after the loved one's death. Uh, the discernment practices kick in at that point uh, really strongly. Uh, what do we know about uh, auditions or visions or senses of presence? We know that the brain's got this incredibly sophisticated simulation machinery that we make sense of the world all the time in part by synthesizing a model of the world in our minds well we we can do that as well with things that are not present that's how we picture harry potter and the lord of the rings you know and we can do it in uh, in such a way under the right circumstances that the that we actually create a sense of presence or we have the feeling subjective feeling that we're hearing a voice or seeing something now, um, mentally unstable people do that, of course, which is why people are so shy to talk about these things. Ordinary healthy people experience it as well under special extreme circumstances. So I would say um, there are two things you can learn from that, drawing on that body of wisdom. One is you cannot trust beliefs that you get based on that experience. It does not mean that your loved one exists somewhere and is trying to communicate with you. And two, um, the fact that you've got this web of love and concern that stretches so powerfully into your life like that is a reminder to keep alive this uh, respect for your ancestors and your loved ones and to carry forward their life projects to the extent that you can in your own life. Uh, I, these, I would say these are two inferences that you can draw that are stable and sound and fit both with most traditional religious traditions, uh, traditional religions, and fit also with the best of what we know from contemporary science. Right. In fact, I'd say much of the discernment you you employed there comes from science, right? Uh, the first half does, uh, but not only from science. Uh, the, the Buddhist monks know a ton about delusional thinking and meditation. They know a ton about appearances, auditions, uh, uh, visions. The, 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 there are a whole bunch of Buddhist practices that lead directly to experiences like that for people who are prone to them. That's why the Dalai Lama, when he's doing his... Uh, or Tibetan Buddhism in general, when they're doing these great big retreats, um, they actually ask you psychiatric and psychological questions and they warn you that there are side effects of this type of practice. So uh, there's a tremendous amount of experience encoded in traditional religions about how to manage the unruly and strange, unpredictable, unfamiliar aspects of human brain functioning. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, Now you've uh, used a phrase, understanding-based empathy, Mm. Uh, to point to something I think you're you're big on. Do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah, sure. I'm very interested in uh, religious and political disagreement, as a lot of people in uh, the field of... Seems, seems to be more and more of that around to, to be interested in. Yeah, I, actually, yeah, I don't know if it's any worse now than it has been at certain times in the past, but it's certainly been as bad as it has been in the last generation or so. So there's, um, there's a very important... Uh, set of work in social psychology about this on the political side. Um, there's a whole bunch of work on moral in moral foundations theory with people like John Haidt and whatnot. 
um, we were inspired by that uh, group of researchers and we were inspired by that to try and develop an understanding of disagreement inside religious traditions. So we're talking now about religious ideology rather than political ideology. But religious ideology turns out to be quite similar to the political ideology and moral ideology. So we've been able to benefit tremendously by the existing work uh, in moral foundations theory, social psychology and the rest. Now, uh, what that leads to is an understanding of um, uh, an understanding of why people hold the religious views that they hold. So that, for example, I could speak to a religious opponent, describe to them what their views are in such a way that it would win assent. My religious opponent would say, yep, you've got me. That's exactly what's most important to me. And I could still maintain the disagreement. And this, if the, my religious opponent can do that with me, then we've established understanding-based empathy. It's not hand-holding, heart-to-heart empathy. That's expensive and, and it, it's really, really emotionally costly and it's very difficult to achieve except with particularly well-adjusted people. It's empathy based simply on factual knowledge about the other person. So it's a cheap and, uh, and uh, a socially and energetically and psychologically affordable kind of empathy, which changes the tone of debate in religion. So it's empathy in the sense of just understanding the perspective uh, as opposed to empathy in the sense of actually feeling someone's pain or whatever emotion they're having. Well, hopefully there's a bit of both there. Um, when I'm trying to understand someone I disagree with, uh, uh, I'm tr well, for example, someone who thinks there are supernatural agents. I don't think there are supernatural agents in the world. I don't think there are angels or demons or ghosts or gods. So uh, if I'm talking to someone who does, and I can say not only what they think, but I can express why it's important to them, um, then I'm succeeding in conveying empathy, which has an emotional component to it, because I'm saying why it's important to them, right? It should naturally have a, an emotional component to it, not just an intellectual one. That's actually uh, what comes across when I do this as a practice. People get that message. They, they know that I sympathize with them even though I disagree. So there is an emotional connection. And, and is this by its nature, a religious or spiritual exercise, according to your terminology? Well, the way I use religion and spirituality is very general, of course. So, uh, yes, from my point of view, sports is spiritual. So, uh, um, yes, of course, it's spiritual. But in, in the general um, way in which it would be implemented by people who think of themselves as conventionally religious, uh, yeah, I would say it, it can take on the form of a spiritual discipline in their narrow sense, right? Try to understand your enemy, not just love your enemy, or at least if you follow Jesus' advice that you're supposed to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, then what that really obliges you to do is to be able to have a conversation with that person where they get, where they can tell that you get them and where they get you. <clears throat> so, yeah, I think people could naturally see it as an extension of their moral obligations as a traditional religious person. Okay. So you have you heard this this terminological dichotomy, cognitive empathy versus emotional empathy? Does, yeah. It sounds like maybe your this thing doesn't exactly map on to that, uh, but it's close. Yeah, it's it's close. Um, yeah, it maps onto it exactly. If the two terms mean this, cognitive empathy, if that's understanding based empathy in the way I've just described it, which mm -hmm. can include emotional components. And affective empathy or the other kind of empathy, if that is the heart to heart, hand holding, Esalen Institute, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> focus encounter group type empathy. Have you uh, ever been to the Esalen Institute? <clears throat> I've uh, been to it to visit, but I've never actually been to a, a session in the Esalen Institute. I actually was recruited to teach a session at the Esalen Institute and talk about something that is not my calling in life. <laughs> <laughs> it was a disaster, but I digress. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> let's see, just quickly, in what sense is sports spiritual? Mm. You, you mentioned that. <clears throat> well, um, in my framework, uh, ultimate reality is at the root of everything, of, of every possibility, of every uh, uh, moral, or with, every, with every possibility that you might realize as a person. So when you strive to realize greatness or goodness or beauty or truth in any of the lines in which we do that in human life, from art to sports, um, you're you're manifesting potential that's written into the structure of nature. And that 
to me, is manifesting the character of ultimate reality. So if you want to understand what ultimate reality is, in part, you need to take your guide from excellence, wherever it occurs. Not just the average Joe's game of tennis, but, you know, watching Novak Djokovic play tennis or something. You're realizing possibilities there on the back of a tremendous amount of discipline that, man, that, that are like revelation. They show you what nature is and they show you what human beings can be. There's actually a famous essay uh, by David Foster Wallace on uh, Roger Federer as a religious experience. Watching Ro- Roger Federer pay, play tennis is, is a religious experience. So, I was um, going to mention Roger Federer, actually, but um, I thought um, your audience might know Novak Djokovic better. <laughs> oh, I think most of them aren't that young. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I don't think Roger Federer, I don't think it's been that long since the climax of his career. The... Um, uh, so final question, you say in your paper that uh, natural theology is typically an, ins- an incipient form of transreligious theology. Now I take <clears throat> natural theology to mean a, a kind of a theological inquiry based firmly grounded in science and the study of nature. Um, but that phrase natural theology calls to mind this famous work by the Paley, this 18th century theologian, I think that was the title of the treatise, right? Natural right. Theology. And, and of course, uh, he famously, this is the, that work is, it gave the title, uh, Richard Dawkins uses the title of his book, The Blind Watchmaker. We won't get into the watchmaker argument that Paley makes, but I will say that, um, you know, he, it was an argument, Paley was arguing that because of the nature of nature, there must be a God, but to look at his argument more generically, he was saying that the nature of nature indicates that there must be a higher purpose. Nature is clearly here to do something. Animals are clearly designed to do something. Now, subsequently, we discovered that, yes, in a sense, animals are here to do something, but natural selection is the process that imbued them with this purpose. So, kind of so much for uh, the God argument. But, of course, that doesn't eliminate the possibility that the whole thing has, in some sense, a higher purpose. And uh, higher purpose, the idea that there is some larger uh, purpose, and a purpose that, that should inform our ethics even, but, but in any event, the idea of some larger purpose uh, unfolding, maybe through the workings of natural selection, through the creation of the universe, whatever, that is a theme that, of course, has been found in many religions, you know, uh, purpose. Uh, teleology. You have not referred to it, and I'm just wondering what your view is. Are you agnostic? Are you, uh, are, are, do you tend to lean against the idea, uh, or, or, or what? Yeah, I lean against the idea of purpose heavily. And um, what we have is a, <clears throat> a structure of valuational possibilities. That's what's objective, not purpose. And there's lots of ways of realizing those possibilities. <clears throat> it's not necessary probably that we needed to have a biology based on 20 amino acids forming proteins uh, we it's not necessary with them may, maybe there could have been another number or they could have been different but far back in the history of our ecology there was some type of, of realized possibility that occurred some moment of choice and that caused everything to go down one path rather than another so i don't think purpose uh, is a very useful category at all in either the teleology form of it or teleonomy when you say there's a purpose built into the natural laws lots of religious naturalists will say teleonomy is important the purpose built into the natural laws but i think that's just a philosophical confusion and as for paley the natural theology does occur in the very very long title of that book Um, and he does work as a natural theologian rejecting information that comes from special revelation, which is the premise of natural Mm -hmm. theology. But his argument is wrong. He makes the same argument that Aristotle made uh, two and almost two and a half thousand years earlier. Uh, Aristotle formed the idea of uh, evolution by natural selection and rejected it based on design, the design argument. And Paley made exactly the same argument that he rejected um, except he didn't name, like Aristotle did, he didn't name the evolutionary alternative. So I think the only problem with Paley's book is that the argument is bad. There's no, no other problem with it. The argument's just bad, and uh, there's no methodological problem with it. He just got it wrong. He's, doing the, he's making the same mistake that intelligent design theorists are making in our own time, and that Aristotle made in his. Right, although as Dawkins himself notes, the first half of his argument is sound in the sense that 
Paley was right to look at animals and say, wait a second, this demands a special kind of explanation. The explanation for, for how this animal got here is not going to be the same as the explanation for how this rock got here because the, the, the animal uh, evidently embodies functionality. So he got yeah. that part right. And, and he can be excused for not knowing about natural selection, I think, in the 18th century. Yeah, sure. Though, though he should have read Aristotle and he should have seen it there in Aristotle. But, um, but in any event, yes, the, um, I didn't say it's a terrible book. Um, the argument's flawed, right? It's actually a brilliant book. His sensitivity to nature uh, is very similar to Aristotle's, in fact. He had immense sensitivity, like Dawkins does, to the, the intricacies of natural processes. Mm -hmm. and it's a very impressive book at that level. It's just that the inference structure he used to get to his conclusions is fatally flawed. Well, at the very end, but the first part, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, listen, uh, so we've been at this about an hour. Uh, I, I, I could keep talking because this is very interesting, but I'll, I'll let you go. So thank you uh, so much, Wesley Wildman. And again, your book is uh, Religious and Spiritual Experiences. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to uh, plug? I mean, uh, 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 I don't know, a Twitter feed or a website people can look at or, or anything? If people want to find out about me, uh, my writings and so forth, wesleywildman.com is the place to go. That's all I would offer at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks again for taking the time. You're welcome. Bob. Okay. Bye-bye.